thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's Immunome Lab Meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Immunome Project, and I will be your moderator today. Chances are you've all heard of or even used the AI-backed chatbot ChatGPT since it launched late last year. In fact, I tried using it to write the introduction to this lab meeting, and unfortunately, each time I tried, it was at capacity. And instead, it offered me this guided meditation on the status of ChatGPT. Trust that the right time for you to try ChatGPT will come. In the meantime, continue to focus on your breath and stay present in the moment. Fortunately for us, our speaker today is not at capacity or offering us a guided meditation in lieu of his talk, which will be about the equivalent of chat GPT in biology and how generative AI can be applied to antibody and protein design. But before we get started with today's presentation, I just want to share with you an upcoming event to honor the 2022 Michelson Prize winners which will take place as a virtual panel in collaboration with the Keystone Symposia on March 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The Human Immunome Project and the Michelson Medical Research Foundation have awarded four outstanding early career scientists with $150,000 grants to pursue their work to advance human immunology, vaccine discovery, and immunotherapy research. This year's winners are an impressive group, and we invite all of you to join the virtual award ceremony. You can register by clicking on the QR code on this slide or by visiting our website for more information. Please also note that the application portal for the 2023 Michelson Prizes will open on April 3rd. Just one more note before we begin. At the request of our speaker, we ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented in today's webinar in any way. We thank you so much for your understanding. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Jian Tong is an associate professor at the Mila Quebec AI Institute and the founder and CEO of Biogeometry, an AI startup focusing on antibody discovery. Dr. Tong's diverse research interests include graph representation learning, graph neural networks, geometric deep learning, deep generative models, knowledge graphs, and drug discovery. Recently, his group released an open source machine learning package called Torch Drug and Torch Protein, which aim to make AI drug discovery software and libraries freely available. During today's presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and then we'll have some time for discussion. With that, it is my pleasure to now turn it over to Dr. Tong. Okay. Thanks, uh, Kristen, for the uh, introduction and also the invitation. It's a great uh, pleasure to present here. So let me try to open up my camera. Or oh, maybe, Kristen, uh, you yes. probably need to give them. Okay. I can start sharing the screen. I still cannot like uh, uh, start my video. Okay, let's see if we can. I'm going to try that. Oh, it works. Okay, great. Okay, so thanks so much for the invitation and also the great opportunity in speaking here. Um, as Kristen said, like uh, now, uh, ChatGPT is really like uh, is a really popular topic, right? So everyone is like uh, talking about the Chat uh, ChatGPT and how can we use ChatGPT in our life, in our uh, study, and in our research. Okay, but what will be the corresponding ChatGPT in marriage? Can we use a techni te technology developed um, uh, in ChatGPT for 
many important problems in, in biology. Okay. So before the presentation, I want to claim that I'm not a bio biologist. I actually a computer scientist. But actually, I'm really uh, fascinated by many problems like uh, in biology and also how uh, artificial intelligence can be um, uh, used to, to solve uh, important problems in, in biology. Okay. So I can start with some uh, uh, big picture. So oh, before that, maybe I also uh, uh, try to disclose, like besides being an associate professor at the Mila Quebec Air Institute, I also serve as a, a scientific and advisor report. Um, in the in the UK uh, startup relations therapeutics, which uh, focused on using AI uh, for for understanding the co causal relationship between uh, genes and uh, and the disease, and also founder of the startup biogeometry, bio which focused on using um, uh, geometric deep learning and also generative uh, AI for antibody design. Okay, so I will start with some uh, a, a big picture. I think for people working on biology now, pretty much, I think we are at the best time because we are now seeing a revolution in both AI and uh, biology. So on the artificial intelligence side, I think in the past 10 years, uh, AI really has made huge, huge like, progress, right? So starting from uh, its first revolution uh, back to 2012, so we see like a, a new network is able to recognize uh, the objects in the image where we are. So basically the new network is able to get the, the best performance on the imaging net uh, data set. So afterwards, there are many important breakthroughs for AI. So um, for example, back to 2016, so the AlphaGo system developed by uh, Google's DeepMind, um, so they beat the best human Go players. So the essential algorithm developed in AlphaGo is a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, for, 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 the, for, the, um, uh, for the gain of Go. Okay. And in recent two years, we, we've seen really like a very exciting progress of like uh, journey models, uh, especially large language models, right? For example, GPT-3 and also the chat GPT. So we have been talking about recently and also diffusion models. So which basically can, we, we can use diffusion models to generate images. Okay. So all these models belong, uh, belong to like journey models, either generate, generating images or generating text. Okay. So another type of like uh, uh, methods which have made huge progress is really the graph machine learning, graph neural networks, graph machine learning, or or geometric deep learning methods. So maybe some of you are not quite familiar with uh, with uh, this uh, this topic, but one very successful example which you have, I'm pretty sure you are pretty familiar with is Alpha Four Two system, also developed by uh, Google's DeepMind. So the Alpha 4 2 uh, uh, system is essentially built on top of like uh, graph machine learning or geometric deep learning techniques because you know like uh, for Alpha 4 2 the very essential idea is to use deep learning to um, model the relationship between the residues in this uh, in the spatial space and the ones we we are able to model the relationship between the residues so we can easily predict their their, 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 their structures in the 3D space. Okay, so you see, so we really have a lot of excitement like uh, for AI in the past 10 years. Okay, so that's one, one side of a revolution, which may be not quite familiar with you. Okay, but then on the other side, Baruch, which are relatively like uh, not new to us, but I'm, I believe you're quite familiar uh, with the, the, the exciting techniques uh, in Baruch. Okay. So in Baruch, I think uh, uh, for me, like I think the most exciting technique is really, really the the high stop uh, DNA sequencing, editing, and also synthesize, right? So nowadays we are able to like uh, uh, do DNA sequencing and the synthesis like uh, in really like a very triple way and also high stop way, right? And why that makes sense because it make, makes huge difference because with the high stop the DNA sequencing and also synthesize, we are basically okay. We can sequence a lot of like. Uh, uh, proteins like DNAs, so we can uh, we can understand the functions of the cells, so we can generate a lot of data, right? So with the capability of like DNA synthesis, we, we can create uh, new 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 DNAs, new proteins. So that's actually really help us understand the functions of like DNAs and also uh, and the cells. Okay, so this is one type of like uh, I think a revolution technique in biology. So another uh, type of like uh, important uh, technique in biology, I think that's also. Uh, is starting making also huge progress. It was recently with the cryo EM technique. So, so with with recent like techniques, now we are able to like solve the protein structures much much faster. So, which means that okay, so we are able to um so uh have more and more like protein structures, which really help us understand the the, the protein structures 
uh, uh, much faster and also better. Okay, so we, we see uh, two kinds of revolution um, in both AI and the biology. Okay, so we can go into a, a bit, a little bit details. For example, going back to AI side, I want to specifically uh, emphasize the, the exciting progress that has been made in generative AI. Okay, so what is the essential idea of gener generative AI? So general AI is like this. Okay, so first we have a huge amount of like data set, let's say on the internet. So we have a lot of like uh, uh, text data and also image data, maybe also uh, speech data, right? So what, what generative AI uh, do is essentially we're gonna train a model, which we call like generative model, okay? So we train a generative model based on the huge amount of data, the text data, image data, and the speech data. So once we train that model, then the model has the capability of generation or we can generate new data from this model. So we can either generate text, images, or speech from this model. Okay, so that's called like generative, uh, generative models or we, what we call like uh, generative AI uh, uh, now. Okay, so I can give you a, a few examples. So one particular example, which I, I believe uh, many of you also have heard about is, which is like uh, large language models, right? So which is used for uh, text generation. So one very well-known example is a GPT-3, uh, which uh, was developed by OpenAI, okay? So, so, so GPT-3 basically allows you to, to generate new text. So let me give you one example. Let's say, okay, you, have, you can give a, 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 a sentence, a starting sentence, then the model is able to help you to complete the rest of the paragraph or the document, right? Depending, uh, depending on how, how many new sentences or new words you want, you want to generate. So that's one example of like doing text generation based on GPT-3, which is which you can debate pretty much on the entire um, uh, text corpus on the internet. Okay, so that's one type of generation, text generation. Okay. So besides uh, generating text, of course, we can also generate new uh, generate images. So specifically, we can also we can actually generate new uh, uh, new images according to um, a, a text. Okay, so basically, okay, uh, give a text description. So we want to uh, generate some images uh, 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 whose like semantics aligns well with the input given text. Okay, so there are many very very well known models in this space as well. For example, like uh, Dali two. Uh, also developed by OpenAI, so which is uh, uh, which is essentially an image generation model based on text, and also another very well model is a stable diffusion model, which was uh, released uh, uh, also last year. Okay, so here let me give you one example. So this is essentially like an image generation model based on uh, image generation uh, example based on DALI two. Okay, so here okay you can you can input a text prompt. Okay, photo of a panda surfing, and then the model. Okay, we are generate. A image like this, which pretty much like uh, uh, the semantic of this image, pretty much like uh, aligns well, uh, aligns well, or depends on the input uh, test uh, description. Okay, so that's so that's uh, from text to image generation. Okay, so nowadays, of course, as we just said, like everyone is talking about like Chat GPT, right? So Chat, what is what is Chat GPT? So Chat GPT is essentially a large language model and also fine tuned for conversation. So, so from, from the point of view of like uh, of conversation, so ChatGPT is essentially a conversation system, right? So, so, so I'm not sure uh, uh, how many of you have played around with ChatGPT. So, so basically, okay, you can you can you can make conversations with the computers uh, with algorithms. Okay, you can you can you can you can input like a sentence, and then and then the ChatGPT will generate the response for you. So remember that okay, all the all the responses. Um, by uh, chat GPT. So this, so these sentences are not like uh, copied from el elsewhere. So they're actually generated by the algorithm. So, so this response may be similar to some of the, uh, the, the text we have in, on the internet, but they are not 100% uh, uh, overlap with the existing ones. So in other words, so this, these authors, this response, usually they are new. Okay. Um, so you can you can you can you can have multiple rounds of conversation with uh, with ChatGPT. Okay, so so that's ChatGPT. So maybe some of you will uh, are interested uh, uh, in okay how in practice how is ChatGPT trend? Okay, so here let me show you some idea. So ChatGPT. So first we have a we have a very very large language models. Okay, so ChatGPT is actually trend based on the text data, pretty much the all the uh, text on the internet. So this one type of data. But besides text, text in the, uh, te uh, besides text data, 
uh, we also have the code data, the code, basically the, the, the programming language, the, the, the codes written by the programmers, okay? And that's why actually uh, ChatGPT is able to answer well, both uh, answer not only the test data, or, but also is able to do debugging, right? Because it's also able to uh, understand uh, codes, programs, okay? So 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 test uh, uh, ChatGPT is, is pre-trained uh, with these two type data using large language models. They call it like GPT uh, 3.5, which is I think is a bit more advanced than GPT 3 uh, uh, they have uh, uh, they had in the past. Okay, so that so that's a pre-trained model. So remember that here. Okay, this is just a pre-trained model. So you can do text generation, you can generate codes, you can generate um, uh, a test. But remember that this pre-trained model is is not tuned for conversation. Right, so so it's not which means okay maybe it can be used for conversation but it's not optimal for conversation and that's why they first fine tune this model for conversation purpose okay so what they do is first they also do some supervised fine tuning so what they did is okay the first collect a lot of label data so the so the label data is like this okay in some conversation uh, context they basically ask humans not ask the 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 the, the algorithms to generate the response but basically ask humans to 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 write the answers right so they will collect many such kinds of like data okay the conversation context and then human response so so we have many many this kind of uh, uh, pair uh, pair data or label data based on this data so we can we can fine tune the model okay so this is so we fine tune the model based, uh, based on supervised learning which is which is which fine tunes the model based on this label data okay and this second step and further so once we have this model we can actually further let this model to interact with humans okay and and then by interacting with humans human can further provide um rewards or, 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 or uh, informative signals to further fine tune the model. So after these three steps, okay, then we are, so then we got a, a model which is uh, fine tuned for conversation purpose. Okay, so that's the high level, uh, the high level idea of like uh, developing or training a uh, chat GPT. Okay, so that's, so that's uh, the, 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 the high level uh, uh, idea of like generative AI for different uh, applications. Okay, so that's, so that's, one side. So another side, as we said, like nowadays in biology, okay. So so we have very very exciting breakthroughs in uh, DNA sequencing, DNA synthesis, and also cryem. And then, as a consequence, the good the good thing is like okay, now the num the number of data in biology is is increasing really really. I think at the uh, at the fast uh, speed, I think uh, the 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 increasing rate actually is is larger than the Moore's law, okay. So let me give you a few examples. For example, uh, based on uh, because of like uh, thanks to the DNA sequencing, nowadays we are really able to do a lot of like a protein sequencing and also um, uh, BCR sequencing, right? So we have a huge data set of like protein sequence, like a uniprot and also antibody sequence, right? Like uh, OAS data set. Okay. So for this sequence, okay, they are unlabeled, which means okay, we do not we do not have other uh, information. For example, the functions of this sequence, right? So we call this like a unlabeled sequence. Okay. So another type of data uh, we, we can got is actually based on, uh, it's, it's also from the wet lab experiments. So we can, nowadays we can have some very high throughput like uh, um, uh, assays, for example, the fish display system, right? So we can, we can, we can, we can, we can actually, um, uh, 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 we can actually test many uh, uh, designed either proteins or antibodies like uh, 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 at the same time, right? So, so by doing this, we can actually, uh, get the, the 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 properties of the of the protein sequence or antibody sequence, for example, uh, enrichment or binding affinity, right? So these are also sequence data. But for this sequence, for each uh, protein or antibody sequence, we know their functions, we know their their activities, right? So we call this data like uh, a label sequence. Okay. So these are uh, one type of data which is mainly uh, about sequence is uh, unlabeled, unlabeled. Okay. So another type of data, which is uh, more about structure, right? So this, so, so nowadays we, we have uh, seen huge progress of like uh, techniques based on cryem, especially after the combination with AI like uh, uh, alpha 2 So we are now now we are able to solve the protein structures and more and more easy, right? So you can see the number of data sets in PDB is growing really uh, at very fast uh, speed. Okay, so this another type of data, structure data. Okay, so so that's what we we have. Uh, we, what we have in biology really like uh, the number of data set in biology is really uh, 
uh, increasing at a very, very fast speed. Okay, so now we have seen the two revolutions in, in both fields, and then that's why I think now is really the best time to work on like a, a generative AI for protein design. Because like uh, for protein design, you know, the, the goal of the goal of like doing uh, protein design is really like we want to uh, design new proteins, new protein sequence or, or, or new molecules, right? And then, so we want to develop some machine learning model, which is able to uh, generate new protein sequence or new molecules. And that's what, and that's exactly the capability of like genetic models, genetic AI, right? So that's why I think uh, here I have a, like a, a, a blueprint uh, on generative AI for uh, protein design in the future. So we pretty much we can have like so pretty much we can have like a similar model like ChatGPT for protein design. Okay. So here we we can also like develop a pretrained uh, generative models. So here uh what the data we have is like uh, we can have a lot of like uh, uh so we have a lot of like a uh, sequence the protein sequence or antibody sequence but besides this sequence data like what we have like uh like what the like what we have that this the sequence data we have in, in chat gpt which is the, the 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 text and also the the code so here we have a protein and all antibody sequence but beside the sequence data, so we also have a lot of like a structure, structure data, uh, uh, PDB data, right? So what are we going to do is we're going to train a huge uh, generative models uh, based on the sequence and the structure data. And once we have this model, okay, so we can we can we can we can start to put in design. For example, given a, a, a antigen, so we can design new antibodies, or the, given a protein, so we can also uh, we can also generate uh, um, uh, protein binders, right? And that's and that's the pre model we have, okay? Of course, this pre model, maybe will be different from what we have in ChatGPT because in ChatGPT, we just need to uh, generate sequence, right? But here, because we need to model both sequence and the structure, so we might, that's why we also need to like have, uh, also need to make use of geometric deep learning techniques because we need to develop joint models which is able to not only general sequence, but also structures, okay? So that's a pretrained model, okay? So remember that in, in, uh, in ChatGPT, so once we have pretrained model, okay, this, this model is further fine-tuned by interacting with the uh, humans, right? And by receiving the feedback from the humans, so we can fine-tune the model for the conversation uh, uh, purpose, okay? So here, of course, if we want to develop chat GPT in biology, okay, we uh we cannot let the uh, algorithm to interact with humans because you give a humans a set of like a, a protein or antibody sequence, humans cannot give you the feedback. But by instead, here actually we have an alternative uh, option. Actually, it's a better option, which is so we can let algorithm to interact with our like wet lab uh experiments right so when uh let's say here you have an AI model so you can design some antibody or protein sequence right so we can design we can we can test all those like sequence in the web lab and the web lab we uh, web lab like by essays or experiments will give us like feedback which which uh sequence has functions uh, uh what kind of like properties each sequence have right and those uh information will be uh, treated as feedback or training data to further fine tune uh, our model. So that's so that's the, uh, the, the 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 high level idea of like developing a similar generative models or chat GPT uh, in biology uh, specifically for protein design. So let me give you an even more concrete. At the end, I think we can have an application like this. Okay. So instead of like doing conversation with humans, we can let's say here is a, a example of like uh, antibody design. So in the in the input, the so humans can input the antigen sequence or or structures. Okay. And then our generative models we are generate a set of like antibody sequence, okay. And then here is we are not going to interact, uh, get the feedback from the uh, humans, but instead we're gonna get back, uh, feedback from the well lab exper uh, experiments. And based on this uh, feedback, the model will be further fine tuned and also gener uh, generate or design a new round of like sequence uh, antibody sequence for 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 validation. Okay, so we can do multi rounds of this kind of interaction or or conversation, and and at the end we we can get the antibody sequence we want. Okay, so that's a high level idea. Okay, so next I'm gonna um uh uh, uh share some of our uh, uh work we have done 
uh, in germ the AI for, for, for drug discovery. So I will start with, with some work on small molecules and later we'll move to some work on, on protein design, okay, and also antibody design, okay. So, so the, the first work we uh, we work we did uh, in our group. So, what we have been focused on, uh, working on is like uh, predicting the three structures of small molecules. So, another another problem maybe you guys are more familiar, which is the predicting structure of like uh, our proteins, right? So, for example, the work uh, done by Alpha too. So, in our group, we also have been working on similar problems, but we focus on small molecules instead of like uh, proteins. So for small molecule uh, structure uh, prediction, so the input is a uh, is a uh, the 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 molecule graph instead of like the protein uh, uh, mRNA assay sequence, and that's our input. And then the output is the uh, is the the three structure of the molecules. And then what we want to do here is we want to develop a generative models to generate the the three structures based on the input molecule graph. In other words, we want to model this conditional distribution, right? Given the input molecule graph G, what would the distribution of the output confirmation get? Okay. Um, so we have been developing different kinds of like generative models for this problem. So specifically, uh, I want to like uh, introduce uh, the, the the latest work we have done, which is based on diffusion models. You know, like diffusion models is is, is very new, and 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 this and this model is actually the first diffusion diffusion model that has been applied for uh, on three D molecules. Okay, so so the essential idea of this model is we model the three D molecule conformation generation process as a diffusion process. Maybe some of you are not familiar with uh, diffusion process. Let me give you uh, some uh, some high level idea. So for diffusion process, so we have two distribution, C0. So this is actually our data distribution. In this case, is, a, is, is a, the, the 3D, uh, molecule uh, 3D conformations of our molecules. And then we have another distribution, which is north distribution. Basically, just this is just a base distribution or background distributions. Most of the time, just a Gaussian distribution, okay? So what diffusion process uh, do is, okay, so first we have a forward process, which is from the, um, Data distribution to the noise distribution. So what? How, how do we do this? And this is very simple. Pretty much, you, you just add some noise. You try to this. Uh, this uh, you, you try to like distort the 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 structure of data. So here specifically in this example. So at every time step, you pretty much just add some coordinate, some noise to the coordinates of the coordinate of each atom. You do this like uh, multiple steps, and at the end, you can just get a random structure. And that's how you destroy. The structure of the uh, of, of uh, the, the 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 orange data, right? And then you 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 can you can map it to a, to a noise in the noise distribution, and that's the the forward process. Of course, in practice, we care about actually the 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 the, the reverse process, which we call the generative process. So the generative process is like this. Okay, you start from a random noise structure, and then as step, what we do is you just do denoising. So basically try to eliminate the noise in the structure, you can get a, a cleaner structure, right? You do this uh, 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 multiple iterations and, and until at the end, you pretty much then can get the, the stable structure, okay? So this is pretty much like similar to what you have like in, in, in molecular dynamics in force field, right? So in, at every step, you try to like uh, up, uh, update the, the the structures uh, uh, according to the first field until at the end you can you can reach a stable uh, uh, you can reach a stable structure okay and that's why like in our model a very very a very very essential component component which we call it like, uh, denoising network so basically every at every time step so we have to do denoising so we have to enumerate the noise in the input structure so we can get a, a refined structure which we call like a denoising network from CT to CT minus one. So as I said, essentially what the model did is like, uh, so you have like, uh, you have a you have a noise structure, you want to get a, 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 a better refined structure, right? So what the model is essentially doing is, okay, we're actually trying to learn the forces over the atoms, not the pseudo forces, right? Um, uh, over the atoms and then later, and we can actually uh, move the, the, the coordinates of, of the atoms according to the forces we have learned. Okay, of course, the forces we have learned must must uh, satisfy a, a condition which is rotation and the translation uh, covariant, which means okay, if you rotate the input uh, structure, the forces over the atoms uh, must be rotated accordingly. Okay, so that's the essential idea of a diffusion model, which is essentially we try to uh, train a denoising de de network. We try to refine the input structure until we reach a very stable structure. Okay. And here, here, here are some examples. Okay, so here you have a different input molecular graph. 
and our model is able to generate different stable conformations. So here is actually a very concrete visualization to show you how our model is able to find the stable conformations. So in the beginning, so in the beginning, you see the, the coordinates. Uh, so that's the, the end. So in the beginning, you see that the coordinates of, the, of all the atoms are actually randomly initialized. And then at every diffusion step or denoising step, so we try to refine the structures uh, of the molecules. Essentially, we try to like uh, update the coordinates of each atoms until its end, gradually like uh, converge to the stable structures of the molecules. Okay, so, so that's the, the first work I want to uh, introduce, which we use uh, generative models to predict or generate the, the the 3D structures of a small molecule. Okay, so that's so that's one uh, uh, one work, and then and then what we did later is that we first actually extend this work. So instead of like trying to predict the, the 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 structure of a single molecule, can we try to predict the complex structure between a protein and the ligand? Okay, and that's what we did. So in this case, the input uh, is not only like a a, a, a a two D molecular graph, but we also have the three D structure of protein. And then we try to predict uh, their complex structure. So the high level idea of this work is very similar to what I, I have introduced. Okay, and then in our in this model, we actually have two components. We first have an encoder. So we what we do is like we try to encode both the molecular graph and also protein structures and also their uh, their interactions. So with the encoder, we can somehow capture the the somehow the the geometric constraints between the uh, the, the 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 molecule and also the proteins and and the, and this encoder. And then in the decoder, so we have a diffusion model or essentially a denoising network. So what do we, what do we do here is essentially, okay, we start from a random structure, a complex structure, and then at every time step, we try to refine the complex structure um, or, or, is, or is a denoising process until uh, after multiple, multiple rounds or iterations, we can converge to a stable structure, okay? And, and you can see that the high level idea is very similar to what we, we just introduced, okay? Um, so here are some results. Um, uh, for protein ligand uh, docking. Okay, so we compare our models with both like uh, uh, traditional uh, physics based methods. Okay, which for example like uh, Vina and also some latest deep learning methods. So in general, can you can see that now in 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 the old days actually the 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 the, the old uh, the Maybe like uh, two years ago, uh, the deep learning method is not able to outperform the 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 physics based method. But now you can see our deep learning method is, is pretty much like it can significantly outperform the physics based method. So in general, here I, I can you like I can give you a, a sense how well the current deep learning method uh, is able to perform. So here basically shows like shows that okay, uh, for sixty percent of the cases, so uh, the structures predicted uh, by the deep learning model um, is actually, uh, if we so if we compare the, uh, the, the distance between the predicted structures and also ground truth structure. So 6% of the cases, the distance will uh, uh, be smaller than five angstrom. Okay, so, so that's the, the, uh, how deep learning model is able to perform. Of course, in this case, uh, in the testing case, all the proteins we have seen uh, in the in the training data. So then we also actually test a, a, another case. Okay, what about a, a protein or a, a, a target? We we never. We, uh, what, what if this is a new uh, protein, new target, right? And how would the, the, the docking perform? Okay. So in this case, of course, uh, the performance uh, is worse. So previous this one is sixty, and then it's it's forty. But so this basically show, okay for those like total new proteins or new uh, new genes. Okay. Um, uh, forty percent of the cases, the, the structure we predict predicted is pretty much like uh, 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 compared to the ground uh, ground truth like a complex structure. So the distance is below like a, a, a five angstrom. Okay. So here shows a, a, a concrete like uh, uh, examples. Okay. So this like uh, 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 green one is a protein structures, and this gray one is a ground truth like a, a, a molecule uh, a position. Okay. So the, the pink one uh, is uh, is uh, structure predicted by our model. So in the beginning, it, it starts from a, a random structure, but after a few rounds of iteration, you can quickly converge to the uh, ground uh, the, the ground truth uh, structure. Okay. So here uh, so here basically shows the the uh, the, uh, the different snap, different snapshots of the of the iteration uh, of the optimization process. So here I want to show that actually at every iteration. 
at every, every opt-in step. Uh, so besides predicting the, the current position of the molecule or the structure of the, um, uh, the, the structure, we actually also output a confidence score. So basic to show you, show you okay, how confident uh, we think about this, like, uh, the, this, uh, this prediction. So this is similar to what we have like, in alpha four. We have metrics like PLDDD. Uh, to 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 show the confidence, but here we also actually give a similar metric to 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 pr to predict the confidence of the current uh, prediction. Okay, so that's uh, uh, on predicting the complex structure between protein and also ligand. Okay, so we we first uh, uh and then and then and we first extend this kind of idea uh, like to to protein design, especially uh, on uh, de novo protein design. You know, like for de novo protein design, the essential idea is we want to design totally new proteins with, with new structures and the sequence. So, so there were a lot of like assignment work in, in the past two years, I think especially by uh, uh, David Baker's group at the University of uh, Washington, right? For example, like uh, the, the, the end of last year, they actually released a new model called like IF diffusion uh for 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 protein design or for mini protein design so what what they essentially did is, is actually they turn a uh, diffusion model or joint model on the entire um uh, pdb they set and then uh, based on that they can they can uh, design new pro, uh, new proteins okay so actually they're always they're, they're always it's pretty much like a two-stage always and so what they did is, okay the first generated the, uh, the the structures let's say here i have like a binding uh protein target and then what the algorithm did is the first is going to generate the structure of the binder, okay? And then once they have the structure of the binder, they're going to further use another model, which is a, a sequence design model. So they use protein MPN to further uh, design the sequence of the, of the, of the binder. Okay, so, so in other words, the algorithm is sort of like a two-stage algorithm, okay? And then, uh, so, so the, the structure generation model which is called like RF diffusion model. So this RF diffusion model is very similar to uh, the model they developed for, for protein structure prediction is the Rosita fault. So uh, in practice, what uh, uh, how, how they train this like RF diffusion model is the first uh, use the pretrained Rosita fault model and then they fine tune the model for, uh, for structure uh, prediction. So we are not going to the details, but that's the highlight idea here, okay. And then, uh, so in our group, we also like uh, uh, work on this problem. So we actually we, we propose another algorithm for uh, de novo protein design. So instead of like trying to like uh, using a two stage algorithm, first generating the structures and then sequence, we actually propose a new model, a, a, a new diffusion model. So which can simultaneously simultaneously generate the structure and the sequence. Okay. So the the key idea of this uh, of this model is still based on the sort of like denoising network. Okay, so in this denoise network, so we have two, we have we actually have three inputs. The first one is the current uh, protein sequence and also the current protein structures and also some contact uh, contextual information, for example, the target structure, right? And then after this like uh, denoise network, we're gonna update the protein sequence and also the, the protein structure, maybe also update the, the repetition of the contextual information. So we can do multiple rounds of uh, multiple rounds of this like denoising and until at the end, so we can get a uh, a stable protein structure and the sequence, and that's a high-level idea. Okay. So here I show you uh, some examples of what we did uh, based on this like uh, new algorithms. We do antibody design and also um, uh, uh, some, some protein design. So here we actually design the, the loops, uh, the CDR loops of antibody. Okay. So we have a let's say we have an antigen and an antibody complex. Okay. So what we did is we're gonna mask out the 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 the, the original CDRs, and then we're going to generate uh, totally new CDRs, uh, both the structures and the sequence. We found that actually the, 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 the new CDRs, uh, uh, the structure, new C structures and sequence we have like designed. So those structures uh, we designed actually very similar to the, the reference complex structure we have, which means that, uh, which means that actually our algorithm is able to recover the the natural uh, uh, complex uh, or the, the natural interaction uh, natural interactions between antigen and antibody so that's one example another example we also do some like uh, and uh, protein design for example in this case uh, so uh, the, the red one is a uh, is a native protein and 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 this is is loop and what we do is actually we fix uh, the other the, for example the beta sheet we try to uh, re redesign the loops to see whether we can uh, design uh, longer loops 
And that's one example. Another one is like uh, we try to design uh, novel beta barrel uh, barrel proteins with different size. Okay, and this one we actually des designed the transmembrane protein co complex with a uh, uh, with a cu customer num number of like uh, alpha helix. Okay, and then so in our group we also actually uh, released an open source machine open source machine learning framework for protein uh, understanding and the design. So we really hope like. Uh, this kind of like uh, open source like uh, uh, effort or, or build up like an open source community uh, can uh, can can accelerate the the, the progress uh, in in this domain. So in, in particular in this uh, in this open source like framework, we we provide a very general and also flexible uh, and modularized framework for protein design. Okay. Um, so it provides a lot of like benchmark data sets and also machine learning models framework. So if you have people work on biology, so so maybe you can easily leverage those like machine learning models for for for, for the for the problems in your in your downstream task. Okay. And 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 this is actually a collaboration between like uh, uh, Nvidia, Intel, IBM, and also my startup like Biogeometry. Biogeo okay. So finally, I want to spend a little bit, a little bit time uh, on what we we are doing in in, in the startup like about geometry. So which focus on using AI or generative models for antibody design. So one problem we work on is we call like antibody optimization. So the problem is like this. So we have like a, we have like an antibody, or we know the comp a complex between an antigen and the antibody, and then we want to optimize antibody to improve the binding affinity. So essentially, we want to make make some mutations, right? So we want to make make some mutations in the complex. Okay. So we actually developed some similar uh, uh, models like ChatGPT for this task. So we also have like pre-trained models. So we, we pre-train our models based on the protein sequence and antibody sequence, as well as some protein uh, complex data. And that's and that's the, the, the first pre-training model we have. And then we first fine-tune the model based on some supervised uh, data. So here we use a SCAMPA data set. So in the SCAMPA data set, there are many protein complex. And for, for each com protein complex, there are some mutations. And for each mutation, we know the DDG, basically the binding affinity change. So we fine-tune our model based on this data set. So then now we have a model for, 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 for uh, protein uh, uh, for uh, uh, protein optimization or antibody optimization. And then we first uh, like, uh, uh, let this model to interact with the well lab experiments so we can design some antibodies and the well, so we can test those antibodies in, in the well lab and then we can send feedback to to to, to the model okay so we can do this multi runs and then and, and, uh, after a few runs we are able to get get a, 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 a optimized antibody so here let me show you one uh, one experiment we, we 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 have done okay so we actually try to optimize a, 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 a sars cov2 antibody uh, which is a CR3022 uh, uh, antibody. So we, we know the complex between this antibody with RBD complex, and then we use our uh, models to design. So in each run, we, uh, we, we design 10, 10, 10 antibodies, and we send the antibodies to, uh, to the wet lab to test. And then after each run, we pick the, the best ones, and then we combine the, the uh, uh, in the first in the first round, we just do single mutations, and, and in the second round, we do like uh, uh, double mutations or triple mutations. mutations. So after two rounds, we, we show that actually uh, for the delta like uh, variance, we see the 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 binding affinity of the of the new uh, new mutants is able to is the 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 binding affinity is pretty much like a threefold uh, of the of the of the binding affinity of the white type, and then this on on the delta delta variant. And on the latest like Omicron uh, variant, we show that actually the binding affinity has improved like nine folds. Okay. And we only actually uh, change three mut mutations. Okay. And that's on like antibody optimization. So another thing what we are doing is really like, uh, we believe that the future is really like the novel uh, protein design and also antibody design. Okay. So in this case, so uh, so we are given uh, input um, uh, uh, protein structures or antigen structures, we can specify uh, the the epitope. So, for example, this RBD like uh, uh, antigen. So uh, there there could be like uh, three different epitopes in the um, in in this antigen. And for each epitope, we're gonna we're gonna design some antibodies. Okay. So this is this one just shows uh, example. The, the the green one is the antigen, and for different colors, the uh, the the yellow one, uh, the, the the this like. Uh, Purple one, so all these are different antibodies uh, uh, binding to different epitopes. Okay, so in practice, maybe you uh, you say, okay, maybe in some in some new uh, 
uh, in new targets, we don't know the structure, right? So in this case, we can leverage the structure prediction model, for example. So in this case, okay, so input could be a sequence. We can further predict the, the structure of the of the uh, of the antigen or the target based on like models like alpha four two, and then we can further do you know antibody design based on the uh, predicted structure. Okay. So that's pretty much what I I want to. Uh, say today maybe I, I, I will conclude, I will conclude uh, with a one, one, one minute one more minute so basically I think I think uh, um, nowadays it's it's really like I think the best time for people uh, who work on biology because now we see revolution in both AI and the biology right so in AI we have we see huge um, uh, progress on genetic models uh, uh, large language models and also geometric deep learning so which means okay so we are able to develop models to, to, to generate new data, new molecules, new protein molecules, right? And then in biology, we have a lot of data uh, thanks to DNA sequencing and also synthesizing. So we, we have a lot of like protein sequence, antibody sequence, as well as structures, right? And then, and since we can comb combine the capability of generative AI and also the, 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 the amount of data we have in biology, right? So we can pre-train uh, generative models on the huge amount of like protein sequence and the structure data we have so that we can generate, generate totally new protein uh, structures and, and and sequence right and then we can further test those like uh, uh, new design uh, sequence and structures in the web lab with, so we can get some feedback we can further fine tune our model so by do this so after a few rounds of like uh, uh, interactions we can we can get the the, the proteins uh, we want okay I think this, uh, I think in the future this is not only uh, gonna make impact in, uh, in 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 drug discovery but also in other fields like agriculture and the food uh, material energy and the climate considering the importance of the functions protein uh, make uh, in real life right so with that i will uh, i will stop here and maybe leave some time for questions thanks very much thank you so much dr tong that was such an interesting presentation and a lot of exciting work going on um, I, I'm wondering if you could just talk about what some of the disadvantages are of the de novo designed antibodies in terms of would they be more likely to be eliminated by the immune system because they're not naturally occurring? Right, right. That's a very good question. So many people uh, ask me the same questions, like especially uh, uh, people work on biology, right? So because uh, uh, they feel like because not, nowadays, you know, like many of the antibodies are actually directly uh, discovered from uh, by uh, uh, doing like immunization on animals, on even on, on humans, right? People believe those uh, those are more natural, right? especially the the antibodies we got from the hu from the humans, right? So there will be a no immune response response. Okay, so the the, the question uh, the the answer is that uh, actually uh, nowadays uh, uh, with AI techniques, we are able to design antibodies antibodies pretty much very similar to antibodies uh, generated from humans. It's like language, language models, right? So, so, so the language models are trained from a huge amount of text data and the, as end. So uh, the models are able to generate uh, text which are very realistic. So here we have a similar, uh, similar like uh, idea. Okay, so we can train the model on pretty much on a huge amount of like, let's say human antibody sequence. And as a result, actually the, the antibodies we generate from the model will be very similar to the antibodies uh, from humans. So in that sense, actually, the, the immune, for the immune system, it's pretty much very difficult to, to distinguish, okay, which ones are from humans and which ones are designed by our AI organisms. Right, right. Okay, that's great. So we had a question come in. Um, aside from increasing affinity, can the generative model improve specificity? For example, eliminating cross-reactivity with rele relevant human antigens. Yeah, that's also a great question. That's also a question I usually got uh, people ask me. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I, think, I, I think it's really uh, so. So that pretty much like um, I think uh, as end when we try to either do uh, I mean antibody design or optimization, I think it's really like a multi-objective like uh, uh, optimization process, right? So which means okay, when you try to so pretty much like when you try to do the design process, so you're gonna consider multiple dimensions. You want to generate antibodies or uh, proteins which satisfy multiple dimensions right nice. so 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 and, and and that's that's something uh yeah so in other words actually in practice we, we always have to um design multiple like predictors for example you have a predictor to predict the, the uh, immunogenicity the stability affinity or other the properties you care right and then you can add the model okay pretty much generate many 
So the, pro the, the, the model is pretty much like a hypothesis generation, right? generator, right? You can generate many hypotheses, right? And then for each hypothesis, okay, you can use your, your predictors uh, to, to filter. As end, you can just keep the ones which satisfy all the, all the, uh, all the, all the uh, criteria you, you specify, right? Right, 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 right. Okay, okay. Um, and we had another question on whether you can use this approach to improve on the immunogenicity of the antibody. Yes, that's what, that's what I was saying. Like, uh, uh, we uh, now nowadays, pretty much like people get okay, trying a huge uh, language models on the on, on that, the yeah. on the human antibody. Uh, yeah. So that like okay, so we we can basically evaluate okay whether this uh, antibody but is from from human not right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we had a question um, on basically using this process to understand um, the dynamic processes that are happening with virus evolution. So if you're looking at SARS-CoV-2, for example, there's more than 10 million sequences of the virus that are available, right? And they provide multiple instances of each mutation in each context of different virus conformations. Um, could, the, could the methods that you've described help provide um, some connection there between the, the evolution of the virus and the sequences that we have to understand virus evolution? Yeah, I think that, that's. Uh, I think some people have done that. So basically, they just uh, pretend the uh, the language. So they have the some, they have some pretend language models on the uh, on the entire like uh, protein sequence yeah. data set, and then they first fine tune the models based on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, mutant the sequence. And they, I mean, pretty, pretty much they they capture the uh, by training a language model on the on the SARS-CoV-2 protein sequence. I think they can somehow capture the co-evolutional information or. or, or or sort of like, uh, yeah, I think to capture the co-average information, somehow they, they can make the pr uh, prediction. I think there, there are some paper around that. And actually, they show that they can predict that, the, make yeah. the prediction quite accurately. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. And it seems to me like the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, the, the optimization of those against, for example, Omicron variants is, is a really great way to try this out, right? Since we're, we've run out of monoclonal antibodies that can actually be used in immunocompromised people to prevent them from yeah, yeah. infection. Is that something that's going forward to be tested clinically by any chance? Yeah, I mean, so we have we haven't uh, uh, moved forward for that like uh, um, antibody, but we are indeed uh, thinking about like collaboration with others on other uh, like more uh, promising uh, candidates because for that one we're just like uh, basic to test the capability of our models. But indeed, actually, so I think uh, that the model has a good cap capability, especially because now we are able to model the antigen and antibody where we are. I think a, a very nice like thing we actually what we want to work on is really. Uh, basically trying to optimize the binding affinity of a specific antibody across multiple different uh, variants so that you can do really like a, a, a cross neutralization across multiple uh, uh, antigens, right? And that's something we, uh, yeah. we really want to work on. Right, 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 right. And then we had a question on, on using this to design anti-idiotypic antibodies. I'm not sure quite familiar with that, so yeah, no, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Um, maybe we have time. Yeah, for one more question. We had a question on whether journal peer reviewers will need to have their own AI system to check the validity of models proposed for publication, or will other validation methods be used? So they, they want to like uh, propose a model to validate <laughs> to validate the model. <laughs> A model for model validation. Yeah, <laughs> I mean right. they can they can do that. Uh, condition on that they have a better model, so right. which, they have more data and also better model. I mean usually at least you you need to have a better model because usually like uh, you know for people working like uh, in in the AI community, so they can develop very good models, but they may do not have like a lot of data. So so maybe yeah. you, you need to have more data in order to be more advantages. <laughs> I think so. I think so. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tao, thank for you. sharing this really fascinating and innovative research. Which, like you said, we really are at such an exciting time in both AI and biology. Um, thank you also to the attendees for participating in today's webinar and for submitting questions. We're so glad, as always, to have you join us, and we look forward to many more engaged discussions. Um, as you probably know, we kicked off the Immunome Lab meeting webinar series last year. So if you've missed any of the previous talks, I encourage you to visit our website, humanimmunoproject.org, 
to view the recordings and to find out about some upcoming sessions as well. And while you're there, please do sign up for the newly launched Human Immunome Report, which is another platform for sharing the research and voices of scientists working at the frontiers of immunology and AI. And finally, please don't forget to visit our website and follow us on social media, where we will post a recording of today's webinar. Thank you again so much for participating today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.